Hello. Um, welcome to this uh, session of uh, art and science of uh, optimizing cloud native Java applications. I'm Siva Balan. I work for G Digital. I'm a performance engineer uh, with, uh, in the, with the security team at G, at G Digital. Um, before we start, I think we have to go over the fire code announcement. And here it is. I'm sure you're to memorize by now. So I'm going to let it be there for a couple of seconds. Um, so in this session, um, essentially, we've been running um, quite a few services, Java services, on Cloud Foundry for the past three years. And uh, we've learned a lot of, uh, lot of ways to deploy and not to deploy, run and not to run Java applications on Cloud. So this session is essentially to give you some idea as to the lessons that we learned on how we optimized our uh, Java applications when we ran or when we are uh, running it on Cloud Foundry. So um, let's dive in as to what we're going to look at. So we know that, uh, just a brief introduction of it, what, what does Cloud Foundry gives us, so, right? It makes it very easy to deploy our applications. We all know about that. And uh, it makes the dependency management a breeze as well, so we don't have to worry about um, uh, uh, you know, not having dependencies when the, when the application is coming up or when it's actually running in the cloud. And uh, it makes very easy to monitor, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit later on how uh, easy it is to monitor. And we also, it also makes sure the app lifecycle is taken care of. Your health checks are taken care of. Uh, if your application crashes, it brings, up very, brings, up, brings it up uh, very quickly and, and uh, effectively as well. And of course, the health checks and restarts are done automatically for you. So just, to ba just a background on what Cloud Foundry offers us uh, to deploy our Java applications as cloud-native Java applications. Now, how do we know that your application is optimized to run uh, on the cloud? So some of the things, uh, I would call it a checklist that uh, we typically look for is, um, how is it performing in the cloud? Is it, uh, uh, is it receiving the request that it's supposed to? Is it processing in the right amount of time? How is the response time looking like? And how is your containers uh, behaving when, when, when the application is running on the cloud? Um, and uh, how is your garbage collection? So espe uh, especially when you run Java applications in the cloud, uh, one of the key things to look for is how effective are, gar are your garbage collections. Um, um, further down on the slides, I'll show you a couple of scenarios where uh, we ran into some uh, very interesting scenarios uh, in, in terms of garbage collection. So <clears throat> how is your connection pools managed? Uh, when I talk about connection pool, specifically I'm referring to your database connection pooling. I'm sure most of the applications will talk to some type of a database on the back end. So uh, managing connection pools and database uh, was a big challenge for us. So I'll tell you why as well. And uh, how are your threat pool managed? So when you, when, you, when you talk about Java applications, we have to talk about threat pools. How do you uh, effectively manage your threat pools? How do you optimize your threat pools to run uh, in, in, on the cloud? And uh, how is your container resources used? So we typically don't, especially developers, don't give a lot of thought about how the container resources are managed when they deploy their Java applications to the cloud. So, um, but from a performance engineer standpoint, I have to, one of the things I look for is how effectively are the resources managed? How is your uh, CPU utilization on the containers? How is your memory utilized? Uh, and uh, we don't have to worry about disk because these are ephemeral disks, so we typically don't store anything in the disk. So, but memory and CPU are something that we need to watch out for. Um, now let's take it one by one. In, in terms of app performance, um, so first and foremost, uh, I always say to every service owner is that never fly blind. Always, always have a monitoring tool in place for you to monitor your service. Uh, in our case, we, you can pick anything of your choice. Uh, New Relic, AppDynamics, Dynatrace, there are quite a few of the uh, tools that are available that easily lets you uh, bind the monitoring tool to your service in Cloud Foundry. Uh, they have service brokers that are available for you to offer as well. So, but please do make sure that your service is monitored right from the time it's deployed. Um, and we have to collect some key metrics. Um, this can either be done through the monitoring tool or you can have your own uh, scripts or services or apps that would actually collect the services for you. Some of the key things that I would suggest is heap usage. How is your heap being utilized by your application? How is uh, the garbage collection pattern looking like? And how is your threads usage? So uh, how many number of threads are being used? How many active threads? How many idle threads? So these are some key metrics you need to collect um, irrespective of whether uh, your application uh, is uh, running fine or not running fine for that matter. But uh, I would say just start with these basics uh, uh, metrics that needs to be collected. 
Now, just to give you a background on what the garbage collection should look like and what it should not look like. So in our case, uh, this is a specific screenshot of one of our services. So which one do you think is more optimal, uh, one on the left or one on the right? Uh, so I would say one on the left, right? So essentially, essentially it's the same service, but using different build packs, we have, we have see, noticed different patterns of garbage collection. So you can see the, the sawtooth pattern on the left is actually the most optimal one, where it's actually nicely collecting uh, the garbage. Uh, the garbage collection is, uh, is kicking in at the right amount of time, uh, at the correct frequencies, um, and, and almost the same frequency every time. But on the right, you can see that the committed heap is slowly going down, which means it's a clear indication of your application having a memory leak. And you can see that the garbage collection is happening in a more frequent interval as well, which also says that it's trying to collect less and less object every single time. So these are some things you need to watch out for when, you're, when you deploy your applications to the cloud. And just to give you an idea, the same uh, slide that we saw before versus this one, you can see the, garbage, the full garbage collection happens uh, very periodically in the first one. But the second one, you can see that it's, off, it's occurring more often, and it's also taking more amount of your CPU cycle. So you can actually see the garbage collection in terms of the percentage of CPU that's being utilized. So you can see that you don't want your application to be something on the right. So you need to be something on the, 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 it, the, the pattern should be something similar to what you're seeing on the left. And this might not be very evident when you're actually running your application on your laptop or in your you know, local environment. So you would start in most cases, you'd start seeing this behavior once you've deployed your application to the cloud. Now, as I said, we need to look at the frequency of the garbage collection, uh, especially the full garbage collection, and we also need to be um, very conscious about how long it takes for the full garbage collection to, take, to, to uh, kick in. One of the reasons I'm saying this is because uh, it, it also depends on how you size your heap when you deploy your application as well. You don't want your heap to be too large, uh, or it shouldn't be too small. What happens when it's too large? So, you're, of course, you'd be able to uh, space your garbage collection at much less frequency, but at the same time, it would take much longer for it to collect all the objects when the full garbage collection kicks in. So, you need to able, be able to find a, a, a balance between how large your heap is going to be and how often you want the garbage collection to kick in. And um, so, make sure that you're conscious about uh, looking at the time that it takes to do a full garbage collection in, your case, in, in this case. Um, now, you also need to look at how, how many objects are being collected in each of the collection, and you need this to be uh, very consistent across the time uh, interval that you're looking at. Let's say you're looking at your service for the past 24 hours. How is your garbage collection looking like? So um, if you have time at the end of the session, I'll show you a live graph of how the garbage collection looks like over a period of 24 hours or three days, so you get an idea. But, but be conscious about how, how many objects are being collected as well. Um, database connection pool management. So this is another key factor that you want to be um, conscious about as well, because especially when you're, if your application is using Spring Boot, uh, the Spring Boot reconfiguration, whether you've noticed it or not, automatically reconfigures your max active connections to four. I'm not sure why it does that, but this has been a very um, painful problem for us. Uh, and it, this happens irrespective of whether your application is a production application or a development application that you push to the cloud. So one of the things we had to do in our Spring Boot applications is that we had to override this auto reconfiguration and actually set the max active values um, uh, ourselves. And, and, uh, and please, watch out for this. So we, we have been in, in situations where we ran out of DB connections for no apparent reason. Um, Another, things, another thing to look out for is uh, you want to size your database connections of your Java applications based on the number of instances you're going to run. Um, for example, your database, your database itself has a fixed number of connections, client connections that it can accept. Typically, if you take Postgres or MySQL, you probably have about 100, maybe 500 or 1,000 connections at the most. Now, let's say you size your uh, database uh, instance connections to, say, 25 uh, connections per instance. Now, when you start say, 10 instances, you're looking at 250 connections. You start 20 instances, you're 500, and at, at 40 instances, you're maxing out the number of connections that the database can accept. So when you size the database connection pooling, you need to be aware of what the max connections are or what the min connections are. So the min connections or the minimum connections are the ones that it actually starts your application with. So typically what we do is we have max connections around 25 to 50. Min connections probably around 5 
at the most, because your application shouldn't be using a lot of database connections. If it is a, a transactional application, it probably would use one to two connections at any given time. So if it actually uses more than that, then it's, there's, there's a problem you need to look at. So what kind of problems might come out? Um, as, you're act, as you're actively monitoring idle and active connections, one of the things that might happen is you may want to watch out for long-running queries in them, because the reason for the database connections to be held on for a longer period of time is because your queries are running slower. And, it re and, it, and as more and more throughput comes into your application, it's going, to have, have, or it's going to at least look for connections and hold on to the connections for a much longer time. So uh, watch out for them, tune them, and make sure that your typical uh, transaction query doesn't take more than a few milliseconds. So that's typically what you need to look at. Anything that takes more than 100 milliseconds, I would watch out and, look, and, and make sure if I can tune them. Um, and there might be some situations where your queries might have to run longer. That's perfectly okay. And, uh, and, and I just want to make sure, I mean, what I, want, what I want to emphasize is that you want to size your database connection pooling based on how your queries are going to perform and have, make sure the long-running queries are tuned. The next one to look out for is threat pool management. This is specifically the Java threads. Um, that your container, either a Tomcat or a Jetty container that you deploy to, uh, how much does, uh, so you, you need to be, make sure, you need to understand what the default number of threads that your container comes up with and how much are the active threads and what the idle threads are. So typically, if, if you deploy your Tomcat, your application deploys on a Tomcat container, uh, you would see about 200 threads uh, uh, by default. So unless you go ahead and tune them, uh, 200 is, uh, is what, the app, what the default number is, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but what you need to watch out for is, again, monitor how many threads are being act are active and how many threads are idle. So you want as less number of threads to be active as possible at any given time because your threads are really, sh they should be short-lived in the sense that your thread should not be held, held on for a long time, when, especially when, you're, when it's running um, uh, transactions. Um, having large number of idle threads is perfectly okay. It just takes up a, a, f a, a memory, but, but make sure that uh, it's, it's not, um, so, so one of the things to look for in, in terms of idle threads, which I've not mentioned here, is, 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 the, is the stack size. So there is an XSS parameter that typically gets um, allocated when your uh, Java application is pushed. And this parameter is allocated on per thread level. So you need to be conscious about what the stack size is for each of the threads and tune the stack size based on um, the amount of threads that you, that you have in your, uh, in your application. Um, the other thing I would look for, again, using your monitoring tool to see how your thread usage pattern is. Um, so maybe when you're looking at the past 24 hours or 48 hours, how is your thread being used? How many active threads? So when does it go up? When does it come down? Um, or is it allocating more than 200, or is it requiring more than 200 threads by default? Uh, so these are some of the thread usage patterns that you want to watch out for uh, if, if you want to optimize your application running on um, in the cloud. Now. One of the things we have also come across is stuck threads. So I'm sure many of you have, been, have come across this as well. And um, a lot of these uh, monitoring tools gives you options to do thread dumps. And I think if you're using Spring Actuator, um, it also gives you endpoints where you can take thread dumps and heap dumps as well. So um, make use of them. I mean, there are tools out there that helps you look into your application and, how, and, and lets you know how it's performing. So I would. Uh, watch out for stuck threads and make sure that it's, um, especially when you're looking at thread dumps, you, you probably want to look at uh, taking multiple thread dumps uh, at, at, say, a five minute interval or a, a one minute interval and see how the threads are moving. Are they even processing something? Is it moving or is it just stuck at one place? So those would give you some ideas as to how the threads are moving around, or how it's being processed. Um, and the other thing is, Container resource management. So this, where this comes up is that um, mostly when developers push their applications to Cloud Foundry, they are not very much concerned about how the container being, the resources of the container are being used. So this mostly resides either on the operators or uh, performance engineers who are actually looking at the performance of the application itself. So uh, some of the key things we look for, uh, we should be looking for when, when, when uh, uh, pushing an app 
uh, running an app in production as well, is you, pro you want to be able to monitor the CPU and, and, and memory usage of the container. This can be either, uh, typically when you do a CF app um, and list out all the instances, you would be able to see the uh, uh, numbers there. Or again, most of the monitoring tools will give you, as part of the JMX metrics, your CPU utilization and your memory utilization as well. Uh, it may not give you the actual container memory itself, whether the JMX metrics would probably give you just the heap metrics, which the heap is being used. It doesn't have access to the memory outside of the heap. So uh, in some cases, what you probably want to do is to write some custom scripts that would actually get the values from some of the CF APIs, which would give you metrics of the containers itself. So um, we've seen situations where um, in older build packs, especially if you're using build packs 3.x and not build pack 4.0 or 4.x, uh, we've seen that uh, if your applications, uh, or especially Spring Boot applications, sometimes require more native memory than it's allocated by the build pack. So we've seen that it's when you when you try when you don't specify when you, when you don't allocate enough native memory, that's which means that you you have so let's say you deploy your application with one gigabyte of uh, uh, container size. Your container size is one gigabyte. It typically allocates 70% to heap, of which I think five or 10% is to native memory. If your native memory requires more than the 10%, then you are, um, you, unless there is enough memory left in the container for it to allocate, it's going to eventually co do a memory, memory uh, out of memory exceptions. So what we ended up doing in the past is to set memory limit in our application, where we reduce the amount of memory given to the heap. Uh, from the default of 70% to say less than 50%, so we give more memory to the native uh, objects. So we may have to play around with the memory a little bit uh, in some cases. It may not be true for all the applications, but watch out for it is what, uh, what I'm trying to say here. Um, implement auto-scaling. Auto-scaling has been a big, big uh, uh, help for us in many, many uh, instances. So, uh, and uh, there is, uh, I think recently there was a, uh, an incubator project for Autoscaler that came out uh, uh, as open source. So please uh, look into it and make use of it. It really helped us a lot. Uh, and I'll, I'll again show you some, if, if I have some time, I can show you exactly where, uh, where, where it helped us. Um, again, in the, you probably want to look at how the memory management is done using the Java build pack. They've done a lot of improvements with the memory calculator in the recent versions of the build pack, which is being used in 4.8 and 4.9. So understand how your memory, memory is calculated uh, and uh, size your memory accordingly, size your container memory accordingly. So it, it, it took us a lot of iterations to come to uh, uh, a place where we are able to run our applications without having to encounter any out-of-memory exceptions. So um, understanding the, the way memory is calculated uh, uh, helps a lot. Uh, heap dumps. Uh, it's, Again, I, I learned yesterday that the actuator actually helps you. They have endpoints to take heap dumps. Uh, we are not using that at this, at this time. I wish we were. But uh, the way we do heap dumps is uh, we have to log into the container, get the heap dumps, and we have to take help from the operators to help us do it. Um, so it was not a very straightforward, it is not a very straightforward process for us at this time, but uh, we're trying to more streamline that. But heap dump helps a lot in understanding situations where you see memory leaks, and especially the graph on the right that we showed you where the memory was uh, looking like it was leaking. So in situations like this, you can take a heap dump, use memory analyzer tools, uh, and, and look at leak suspects. And, and, and this has helped us a lot. So make use of the heap dumps and make use of the actuator, uh, the Spring Boot actuator uh, as well, which gives you uh, a lot of capabilities to take heap dumps or thread dumps in that case. I'm rushing past because I've got a lot of content to cover. So apologize or stop me if, you, if, I'm, if I'm going too fast. Um, one of the things that really helps, which the developers may not be aware of, is, is doing some capacity planning uh, before you de deploy your application. Um, as I said before, size your container. Uh, do some tests, non-functional tests. Size your container based on the heap usage. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're not uh, overutilizing the memory and running into situations where you're running into out-of-memory exceptions. Um, number of instances. So you want to you want to first run tests that would identify how many transactions a particular or one instance of your app can, uh, can uh, serve. And then you scale it based on um, the number of uh, transactions that, would, that your service is going to expect. So let's assume your service uh, can sustain a throughput of uh, 
thousand requests per minute for uh, for one instance. Now, if you're expecting ten thousand requests, I would at least size it for twelve instances. So, just to give you an example. So, the only way to find out is to uh, make sure that you uh, understand uh, how how much of uh, how much throughput a, a single instance can can uh, withstand, and then scale it accordingly. Uh, but make use of it. Um, in G Digital, we run uh, some we three types of tests, essentially. Capacity, scalability, and uh, endurance. Uh, capacity is basically to understand how much a single instance of your app can withstand, or how much a single app, uh, withstand, uh, when I say withstand, how, how much uh, traffic it can, uh, it can serve. And then based on that, we optimize it for the single instance, and then we scale out, you know, scalability test to see if it actually scales out to the number of instances or the throughput that we wanted to serve. And then the endurance is basically to run a very long-running test, say, for a week uh, or 10 days uh, to understand memory leaks, resource leaks, and so on. So these tests really help us to, uh, to make sure that the, the, the Java application that we're deploying to production is well-tested in, uh, in all fronts. Um, Understand your failure points. It, it, also, it, it, it helps to understand um, how much your application can withstand and how does it recover. So that's, that's the key part. So um, every application at some point is going to face a situation where it's going to crash. Now, you need to be able to understand when it crashes, how does it recover, how gracefully it recovers, how long does it take, what kind of errors you, you can foresee. So this, testing these would actually help you in, you know, when you get paged at the middle of the night to understand where the problems are. So um, this has really helped us to actually get to a point where the application fails and then recovers uh, uh, from when, when the load comes down. Um, we've done some chaos monkey testing. This is the term coined by Netflix. Um, and uh, we randomly bring down uh, instances uh, to understand how, it be, how the application behaves. Uh, if time permits, I would highly recommend doing some testing for uh, any Java application, and for that matter, any application itself. Um, uh, and in, in Cloud Foundry as a platform actually gives you capabilities to automatically bring up your instances. So when you try to bring down instances uh, or try to crash instances, it, the health check actually helps to bring it up for us. Uh, but uh, it, nevertheless, in some cases, it does help uh, when you want to bring down your database or Redis cache or something to that effect to see how your application is behaving. Um, Let's look at some of the case studies. So uh, I think we have about uh, eight minutes left. So it, it, in this case, um, we, we can see that the first, the first part of the graph, you can see the service was running fine. I mean, this is actually a graph of about three days. Um, so the first part, the, the service was running fine. And then all of a sudden, you would see both, that's the entire heap. On the right, you see just the old uh, generation of the heap. So you can see that the committed heap start going down, which means that the objects in the committed heap, the, the heap are not getting collected. And ideally, in my experience, when it comes to a point where your used heap and your committed heap gets together, that's where you see out of memory exceptions, which means it, but in this case, you can see the application was running fine. For the rest, for another, for two days, two days. I mean, it's, it was still continuing to run fine. I just gra grabbed it for three days, but in spite of the fact that your committed heap and used heap are almost the same, which means there's very little mem memory that's available for the heap to allocate for new objects in the old generation, you can still see that it's it's running fine. It's collecting the uh, garbage. It's doing garbage collection. It's running fine, and. Um, uh, what you need to understand is that the, the way JVM behaves in certain instances are uh, situations where it might look like there, might, there is a leak, but it typically may not be a leak at all. And, and the fact it's not a leak is because even though your committed heap and used heap are exactly the same or very close to each other, it still doesn't throw an out-of-memory exception. It runs fine. But the side effect of this is that you would see a lot more full garbage collections happening, which means a lot more resources or CPU is being utilized in your application. It's just the behavior of the JVM. In this case, I think it's JVM 1.8, uh, 101, I believe, is a minor version. But uh, it probably is just the way your JVM behaves, or the way your application behaves. Uh, 
Taking a heap dump will help. We took some heap dumps in this case. Uh, we analyzed the heap dumps. We couldn't find any leak suspects. Um, so uh, it, it probably is not a leak. It's just the way the, be the JVM behaves. So as I said, there was no leak suspect in this case. Um, the older build pack was working fine in the sense that the older build pack did not exhibit this behavior. So we're still trying to find out what is new in the 4.x version of the build pack. Um, <clears throat> so this is another very peculiar situation. So we were running a service with multiple instances of it. So on the left, you see instance one. On the right, you see instance zero, so the two instances. Um, so on the left, you can see a, a very nice graph that you typically want to see. On the right, you see that it's, again, we're seeing a situation where the amount of memory is, is going down. It's the exact same service, same code base, except it's running on two separate instances of, uh, of the app. Now, I don't have an answer for this. So I was hoping one of you uh, can give me some ideas as to what might be causing this. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so we took some heap dumps. There were no leak suspects. So, and we're trying to figure out what was causing, and we're still scratching our heads to figure out why one instance might behave like this, the other might behave like this. So, what I wanted to show is that you would encounter situations like this when you deploy applications to cloud. When you run cloud-native Java applications, there are situations that you'd face. And one of the ways we got around this was to just go and restart this particular instance, and everything was back to normal. And we still couldn't figure out what was causing this problem, but watch out for this. And uh, it's, it's interesting that it might come across this too. Um, the last case study that I wanted to show is um, we ran an endurance test for three days, and uh, it was a very small memory leak that we observed on all the instances. Um, and uh, the heap dump was not very helpful in identifying the leak suspect. And what ended up happen happening was one of the external dependencies that we had um, was leaking memory because uh, the external dependency uh, was it was part of the uh, the JVM. Uh, it was. It, it was doing a bytecode analysis, essentially, and that was called leaking memory in some cases. So in this situation, what I'm trying to tell you is that it is possible that your code that you've written may not be the problem. Because we have external dependencies uh, that we rely upon uh, when deploying, that might be causing too. So one of the ways to troubleshoot your problem is that if you can't find a leak suspect in your code, try removing the external dependencies and see if that resolves your problem. So that in, in maybe... Uh, four out of 10 situations, that might be the cause of the problem as well. So um, that's all I have for this. And I, uh, I think we have a couple more minutes if I'm open for questions, or I can show you some of the uh, auto-scaling thing that I was talking about before. Um, while I'm showing it, if you have questions, please, please feel free to uh, ask the questions. So, yes. Um, yes, uh, one of the tools we looked at was Sensu, um, or Graphite and Grafana as well, like using Elasticsearch, and we did use it as well as a backup. Um, and it works fine, I'm not saying no. Um, so we, we used Elasticsearch for quite, you can actually write your own uh, HTTP request, get the JVM metrics, put it in Elasticsearch, and graph it through Grafana or, or Kibana. Uh, it works fine. And, yeah. yeah, it works fine. Exactly. It just gives you these uh, SaaS tools gives you a little bit more. You pay money, you get a little bit more functionality of it. That's pretty much it. But yes, you can. You can. Yeah, sure. So this, is, this shows you the autoscaler uh, service that we're using. So you can see uh, it scales up and down depending on uh, the amount of. Uh, uh, so I think we, were, we, have, we had uh, used CPU as our metric to determine autoscaling. So uh, between 100 and 300 percent. So I think every time it hits 300 percent, it will scale another instance. When it comes below 100 percent, it'll, it'll uh, scale down an instance. In our case, it can score go up to 800 percent because it was an eight-core uh, runner, I believe. So, so yeah, auto scaling works really well for us. So please make use of it. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you was uh, this is a live application that's actually running right now, and uh, and you can see the last 24 hours. Uh, it, it works just fine. Uh, so you can see the memory, heap memory usage, the old, uh, mem the old gen, and, and if you look at the garbage collection, it's very nice. The full garbage collection was very spaced out, I think every eight hours, which is very nice. So this is typically how your application should be running. Um, and, uh, and you can look at uh, the throughput for the application, which is actually, I think this is quite high. 
Um, and it's probably around um, 10,000 to 12,000 requests per minute, I believe. So the service, yes, please. Okay. Exactly. Um, so one of the things I would look at is uh, I would of course take a heap dump to figure out what is what is what objects are in the heap which actually makes it grow bigger and bigger. So you're saying the amount of time it takes grows larger and larger, or the amount of heap. Oh, I see. Okay, so which means that it's taking longer and longer for it to clear the uh, the, the garbage collection. But do you also see the fact that it's uh, the amount of heap is the same uh, in that case? Um, the used code cache gets larger every time. Okay. Um, but the other the heap memory usage is, is flat. Oh, I see. Okay, I can let's let's talk offline. I think there's uh, I'm running out of time. So the last question, yes. Yes. Which settings is that? Okay. Oh, I see. I, I have not. I have not used that uh, feature, unfortunately. Sorry. Oh, I see. Okay. I, okay. I have not come across that, unfortunately, uh, in, in, in my situation. I may have to look into it. Uh huh. Oh, I see. Interesting. Oh, interesting. Okay. Thank you. I'll take a look at it. Thanks. Appreciate it. I think I'm out of time here. Um, thanks for coming, and I'll be outside if you have any questions. Thank you.